there's a snow angel in my backyard that I didn't make. My daughter giggled, her limbs splaying in and out, swiping across the snow. After getting up, making sure not to ruin her masterpiece, Rachel looked on proudly. Not bad, I chuckled, ruffling her hair, but I'm the best at making snow angels. Before I could get onto the ground, Rachel spoke. Nuh-uh, you already made one, and it looks terrible. I paused, eyebrows furrowing. Did I? Is that so? Show me then. She pointed at something a couple meters away. When I took a look, I felt my heart skip a beat. Like she said, there was a snow angel on the ground, but it wasn't mine. The body was frail, judging from the thin body of the snow angel. Lanky limbs that were almost the same height as me trailed on each side of the body, and the head looked as though it had been drained of all juice, simply a shriveled raisin, connected by a needle-thin neck. I looked back at Rachel, who stared at me with complete sincerity. Did, did you do this? I asked, more curious than anything else. It didn't make sense. I would remember an act like that. Rachel tilted her head. Obviously not. It's skinny and long, like you. She burst into another fit of giggles, but I found it hard to join her. I looked around our backyard, searching far past the fence. When I eventually looked at our neighbors, I scoffed. Is this Gower's son? Andrew must have done it. That brat got me good. I'll give him that. I'll have to get back at him. My wife called us over for dinner, and Rachel dashed past me, disappearing inside before I could stop her. I sighed before following her. As I got to the door, I took one last look behind me. Hey honey, how about we install some security cameras? Emma continued to prepare the table, not bothering to look behind her. For what? She finally replied. Her voice drained from a long day of teaching. I hesitated. Well, security. The truth was, I didn't know why I wanted the cameras myself. Despite explaining to myself that it was just Andrew playing a prank, I still wanted to play it safe. We've lived here for 10 years without issue, honey. Why would we install security cameras now? I opened my mouth to respond, but decided to let it go. Yeah, you're right. Throughout the day, I couldn't help but think about the snow angel constantly looking outside. It was strange, since despite the snowflakes falling, the indents were never filled. As the night drew to a close, I promised to check outside one last time. I expected to find nothing and finally get rid of this aching paranoia. But as my phone's flashlight draped over the snow, my concerns were realized. There wasn't just one snow angel. The entirety of my backyard was littered with grotesque indents of bodies, each one varying in size and shape. Some were lanky, their limbs stretched to the point of disproportion, while others looked like bloated corpses that had drowned in a river. Their bodies distended and stretched. Some didn't even have arms to begin with, only their legs splayed out to simulate the wings of an angel. This couldn't have been a prank anymore. I started backing up to alert Emma, but I stopped as my phone slipped out of my hands. As I bent down to pick it up, the sound of my footsteps continued, or at least, I thought they were mine. I lifted the device, its light illuminating in front of me. Footsteps leading to the house were engraved in the snow, but they didn't match my own. They were larger, deeper, and longer. Worst of all, they were appearing right in front of me. The sound of crushing snow alerted me to something that was mere meters away from me. Accompanied by it was the imprint of a grotesquely long foot appearing right in front of me. Yet there wasn't anything that could have made it. Nothing that I could see. I sprinted the other way, practically slamming the sliding door behind me. Looking through the glass door, I could see the footprint standing outside, idle, and waiting. Claw marks began appearing on the glass, accompanied by a horrendous screeching, like nails on a chalkboard. Emma made her way downstairs, clearly asleep not a moment ago. What the hell was that sound? When she reached the final step, the claw marks paused at the arrival of a new voice. You could have woken Rachel up. I could tell she wanted to yell, but held it in to refrain from being a hypocrite. Honey, there's something out there. I tried to sound calm. Even though my heart was pounding hard, Emma tilted her head, shoving me aside to take a look outside. Her face morphed, from irritation, then to shock, then to confusion. What the? She mumbled, unable to phrase her question right. I think something is causing this. 
and I don't know. What do you mean something? Emma's arms tighten around herself, her fingers digging into her shoulders. It, it's probably just Andrew or something. She used the same rationale I did earlier, and it was obvious she was trying to convince herself of it. Emma, there's something outside. I also thought it was Andrew at first, but I took a deep breath. Taking in the scene before me, snow began to fall for the first time in a while, slowly covering up the footprints. Now I just looked more insane. I turned back towards Emma to give her more of a reason to make her think I was a lunatic, but her eyes widened in horror, covering her mouth. When I looked at what left her in such a state of emotion, I damn near felt my heart stop for the third time today. Vague silhouettes lined the outside of the house, the snowflakes falling upon them giving them shape. Each time the snow landed, it would melt moments after, but it gave me enough time to make out what these things were. Then the scratching continued. This time, however, it was far more aggressive. Claws, mandibles, or whatever the hell those things had, dug into the glass, etching deeper and deeper into it. In a matter of seconds, the glass door was covered in a multitude of gashes, the structure threatening to give up. I dashed to my bedroom, where I pulled the hunting rifle from under the bed. As I left the room, the sound of glass shattering stopped my heart dead. Looking down the stairs, I saw the snowy footprints matching the ones I saw outside, making their way inside my house. Stepping atop of the shards of glass, Emma was being held by one of those things, judging from how she was struggling against something, unable to move. I aimed the rifle at where I thought it was, causing Emma to let out a shriek. Before she could say anything else, I pulled the trigger, the blast piercing my ears with a horrific screech. Everything seemed to move in slow motion as Emma fell to the ground, blood coating her chest. For a moment, I questioned everything. Had this all been some paranoia-induced fantasy? Had I just imagined all of this? All of the other creatures inside skittered out as tens of snow-covered footprints made their way outside. That's when I saw her move. Relief washed over me as it looked like she pushed something over. Though my legs violently shook, I found it in me to run down, making sure she was okay. Her clothes were soaked in blood, but her next words put me at ease. It's not mine. Beside her, a pool of blood began to form under where the creature lay. Hands shaking, I stretched out a finger to feel if it was still there. The moment I felt it, the monster stood up and ran out, a trail of blood following behind. Silence didn't last long, as Rachel ran down, crying her eyes out. Daddy! She leapt into my arms, and I held her tight. It's okay, sweetie. It's okay. Mommy is okay, don't worry. I did my best to hide my trembling hands from her. Emma grabbed my shoulder, causing me to turn to her. Let's go upstairs, all right? She had a gentle smile on her face. How she could say face in front of Rachel after all this still amazes me. I guess that's why she's a teacher and not me. It would have been impossible to explain this to the police, so we didn't. We had our glass door fixed, installed various security cameras, and made sure to keep our blinds closed at all times. I had debated moving, but considering our financial situation and how much Rachel would complain, we couldn't. Emma got her gun license, which she insisted wasn't because of what happened that night, and Rachel soon forgot about the incident entirely. The house didn't feel safe after that. Even though I never saw those snow angels or any footprints, I couldn't bring myself to believe they had actually left. I checked the camera footage regularly, and not once did I see anything out of the ordinary. Emma tells me the gunshot probably scared them off, and that they were like wild animals, but it did little to quell my fears. I should be relieved that nobody ended up hurt, but when every sound causes me to jump, or whenever something moves in my peripherals, I can't help but dread the next time winter comes. I used to go to movie nights to meet people and break out of my shell. I wish I never had. Moving to a new city is hard, but finding ways to be social and make new friends is even harder in my opinion. I'm usually not great at introducing myself and I definitely struggle to keep conversations going. So when a coworker of mine invited me to a weekend movie night group, I was ecstatic. I could finally get to know some local people and maybe even create some positive relationships, which I admittedly am terrible at doing. Movie nights were super fun. Most of the time, we would watch something lighthearted or a comedy that was easy to enjoy, 
Occasionally, we would watch something scary, and we would indulge the women in the group with a viewing of the romance genre ever so often. I definitely made some friends within the group, and it was something I looked forward to. Then, the pandemic came along and threw a wrench in all the gears. Or at least I thought so. I remember getting a text from Ben who had created the group chat for us so that we could all keep in touch. Hey guys, movie night is back. We will be using Hulu's watch party feature to get the band back together. Can't wait to see you this weekend. I can't lie. I was so happy to have something to do. My job was entirely remote at that point, and being a single bachelor during the COVID madness wasn't exactly a fun time. So getting to see my friends and spend time watching movies together again would return some of the normalcy that I was missing so badly, like so many of us wanted at that time. But we never did have the watch party on Hulu. Not really, anyway. We still had a watch party, but it was just a bit different than we had originally planned. Ben ended up texting us again, a couple of days after the initial plans were made. Hey guys, sorry if this wasn't what you were expecting, but I was wondering if you'd be open to watching some independent film. My cousin is in film school, and he and some of his classmates are in need of an audience to watch several films for an assignment this semester. I thought that maybe our group could be of some service to them. The films will be screened via Zoom meetings. Thoughts? We all came to the consensus that we would help the students out, even though we knew some of the content was probably going to be pretty shitty. It felt like the right thing to do. Maybe we would all feel good about something, other than just staying at home and lowering our risk to spread or catch a disease. So, the decision was made that we would go through with helping out the film school students. I myself felt like it was a good decision at the time. We watched the first film a couple of weeks later. We all figured it would be a long and arduous ordeal, but it was anything but that. The film we watched was the first part of several we would end up watching. It didn't have a title, there were no credits, and we didn't know who directed it. It was just a video on our computer screens. And let me tell you, what we watched was fucking mesmerizing. The film was clearly a horror film, filmed on some sort of camcorder or older video equipment, and had a very obvious and deliberate found footage style. There was a woman tied up and blindfolded. All four of her limbs were tightly lashed with rope to the size of an old and dilapidated metal bed frame. The screams of her terror were agonizing to hear. Please, I beg you, don't do this. I have a baby. She needs me. I'm not ready to die yet. Somebody help me. Get me the fuck out of here. The door swung open and crashed violently into the wall. The shape of a darkly dressed and hooded figure appeared in the corner of the screen. The woman stopped screaming, and all you could hear was breathing, hard and labored breathing, coming from whatever entity that had just entered the room. The woman appeared visibly frozen and speechless at this point. Slowly, you could see the shape of what seemed like a long metal object slide out of the sleeve that had belonged to the menacing figure on the screen. And then, almost as if possessed by some animalistic and carnal force, it leapt onto the bed frame and began slashing and hacking the weapon about wildly, without any regard for convention. The quality of the film was so grainy and pixelated that you couldn't quite see what was actually happening to the woman in the frame. But the screams and noises she made were absolutely terrifying like nothing I had ever heard in any horror movie. As the minutes went by, the noises became less frequent. The struggle from the woman was less noticeable, until finally, the barely discernible image of her body was limp and lifeless. The only thing you could still hear was that breathing. <sighs> then the hooded figure turned towards the camera, walked towards it, and a black hand suddenly reached upwards turning the screen completely black. That was the end of the film. I have to tell you that it was incredibly hard to wrap my head around what I watched, not because I didn't understand it, but because it felt so real to me and something inside of me just felt off. I couldn't quite place my finger on what it was, but whoever made this short film had certainly struck a nerve with me. I couldn't remember the last time I had watched something that intense. Nobody in our group really talked about it either. There were a couple of holy shit, that was nuts, texts, and some wide-eyed emojis in the group chat. But that was the extent of the commentary that existed after we watched the first part of the film. And there was more than just one part. The next three weeks, we watched the hooded figure kill and torture new victims, 
in almost the exact same way that it had in the first video sequence. The strange thing about it was that it never got any easier to watch, and I was left with this empty and dull pit in my stomach each time. It was sickening to me. I wasn't enjoying it. Clearly, I wasn't the only person that felt that way. Our audience began to decrease slowly over the course of the viewings. Apparently, it wasn't easy to stomach for some of my other friends in our group. I even sent a text to Ben about it because it bothered me so much. Hey man, can we ask these students to move on from the torture porn bullshit? Like, it's super realistic, and whoever they got to act this shit out with them definitely sold it a thousand percent. But Jesus Christ, dude, I'm sick of it. About two hours later, he texted me back. Hey brother, yeah, I'm sorry about all that. I texted my cousin and let him know that it was a bit over the top for our group. Haven't heard back from him yet, but I do believe we will be moving on to something different now. I will keep you posted when I get the details, but appreciate you hanging in there. You're a real one, lol. A real one. I guess that was nice to hear at the time. I'm just glad that we were moving away from the horror genre. I would have much rather had limited the intensity to something like Cabin in the Woods and stuck with the Hulu watch party like we had originally planned. That would have been so much easier. Usually when I wake up at night, the first thing I notice is a red light. The red light that comes from the alarm clock that sits next to me on my nightstand. But about one week after we stopped watching those awful movies, I woke up and noticed a small green light in the corner of my room. I noticed that first, and when I tried to get up, I couldn't. My arms and legs were tied to the post of my bed. Oh fuck. For whatever reason, I had not been blindfolded, but I was most certainly helpless and stricken with fear. This shit can't be real. It's some kind of fucked up dream. It's just a goddamn movie. Some stupid fucking movie. Then I heard it. The last thing I wanted to hear in the world in that very moment. <sighs> my bedroom door flew open and I was confronted with the very horror that I had been watching on my computer screen those last few weeks. It was in that moment that I realized the truth. I never watched some kid's film project, did I? I could see the metal object slide out of the figure's sleeve, except it wasn't as grainy and pixelated this time. Clearly, it was an old and partially rusted machete. Its edges were stained red and brown. I looked directly at my would-be attacker. Guess this is the end of the line for me, isn't it? I don't suppose you'll be screening this shit for the viewing pleasure of your film class. Then, a very odd thing happened, one I still can't understand. The figure turned towards the corner of my room, grabbed the camera that had been mounted in the corner, and then proceeded to use the machete to cut each of my limbs free from the post of my bed. For some unknown reason, I had been spared. I'm not really sure how long I laid there. I was paralyzed with fear. Hours, I'm sure. The next weekend, I moved out and started a new life for myself somewhere far away from that horror. That was three years ago. The Strange Letter, an anonymous book gifted. I go to this local library fairly often. It's like a second home to me. The people here, the smell of the books, the coffee shop inside, everything is perfect. But today was different very different. As I walked into the library today, something majorly felt off. Very off. The atmosphere felt vastly different. It's just a gut feeling. There's nothing wrong, I thought. I ordered my usual cup of coffee. Just then, one of the staff members there called me. This is Mike, right? She asked. Yeah. Someone has gifted a book to you, Mike. Oh, amazing. Do you know who sent it? I'm sorry, the sender didn't mention their name. I'm new here, so I don't know them. I see. Thank you. I was excited yet confused. Why would someone randomly gift me a book? Who could it be? I sat down with my coffee and started reading. Drawn in so quickly, the sender had great taste. I was completely hooked. I turned the pages quicker than usual. It didn't even feel as if I was reading. But soon, that flow state I was in got disturbed when I noticed something between the next two pages, a regular envelope, resplendently laid there in front of my eyes. I opened it up. Dear Mike, follow my instructions carefully. Once the clock hits four, do not speak. Do not question anything you see. Follow what the rest of the people do. Please be careful. Do exactly as I say. I felt frightened. 
It was five minutes to four. I didn't have much time to comprehend what I just read. These five minutes of my life felt more anxious than anything. Maybe it's a prank, right? I thought to myself. It was four, and it got pin drop silent. Everyone stopped what they were doing. I did the same. Soon they all gathered together and made a circle. Straight posture. No one was even blinking. No expression whatsoever. There were about 30 people here. We all stood together silently for a few seconds. Then suddenly, as if something snapped, they all started behaving different. Inhuman. Their hands moved in weird directions. You could hear the noise of bones cracking. And soon, like zombies, they bent down, facing their head to the ground. They started walking away in unique paths. I followed what they did. We often bumped into each other, and soon, this stopped. They got up and went back to where they were going. I felt really scared. I waited for what would happen next. It was exactly 4.10, and the zombie-like stance they were in disappeared. Everyone went back to normal. I asked people around, Hey, what just happened? And they all looked confused, claiming that nothing unusual took place. They didn't remember anything that has happened. It felt as if everyone was possessed. I was ready to pack up my stuff and leave as fast as I could. No way I was coming here again. No amount of therapy would fix this. I grabbed my book as I headed my way out. As I picked up the book, another envelope came out. This envelope was never there. I clearly remembered. More anxiety crept in as I opened the second envelope. Dear Mike, be here tomorrow during the same time you regularly come at. Follow as I say, if you don't want to get in trouble. Guys, I'm about to go to sleep and I need advice. What should I do next? Should I go tomorrow or not? Hey guys, thanks for the support. I decided to go to the library like you guys advised. Took a lot of courage. Here's what happened throughout the day. I entered the library feeling nervous. Before this incident, I always felt elevated whenever I came here. This place would take away all my dread and now, ironically, it was the source of it. Hey Mike said Sarah, who was sitting next to Sua and Harajit. These three have been my library best friends. We met through the library, and since then, we've come here every day, sharing our thoughts on various books with each other. I asked them about the incident, explaining what happened after 4 p.m., but they all looked clueless. Hey Mike, about what you said yesterday, I think maybe you were just stressed out. You need a break, said Sarah in a concerned low tone. Sarah, I'm fine. Let's not think too much about yesterday, I told her. I had a plan. I had a micro camera attached to my shirt today. Since they didn't believe me, I'll prove it to them after today. I even carried a weapon, in case I ever needed it. I opened the book sent by the anonymous gifter. It didn't have a title, which puzzled me. Nevertheless, the book looked alluring with its merlot color, tinted with earth-like gold at its sides. How mysterious. The book was also similar to my situation. The protagonist felt a sense of velicor when passing through the vintage bookshops next to his new house. As he decides to explore the place, he soon regrets his decision. As expected, a new letter had mysteriously arrived. I opened it up. Dear Sam, you must not look at the visitor's eyes. An easy task. I could do that. The clock hit four, and the procedure took place. People started walking around like zombies across the room. Soon, everyone stopped and made a line. The door creaked. It seemed as if someone had come inside. From far away, I could make out a black silhouette, which came closer and closer. Whoever this person was, clearly had some malevolent motives. It had this undeniably strong aura to it. Everyone look at me, right into my eyes, said the figure. I maintained my calm and lowered my gaze. The figure came closer to me. My heart almost skipped a beat. The figure was covered in black clothing and a thick mask, only their red eyes visible. I managed not to look at them too much. Then, the figure stopped. Everyone look at the bowl in the corner of the room. A blade is next to it. You must put three drops of your blood inside it. No more, no less, said the figure. A line was formed as everyone took turns adding their blood. I was far at the end trying to decide whether it would be a good idea to do it or not. After all, 
I had no other choice than to add my blood into it. I took a deep breath as I ran the blade through the palm of my hand. Pearly red droplets of blood formed. I squeezed my hand causing more blood to flow out, adding three droplets into the bucket. I felt dizzy. After everyone was done with it, the library went back to normal. Ouch! I have a cut on my hand, screamed Sarah. Stop being dramatic. You probably got a paper cut, said Sua. It looks too deep for a paper cut, Sarah exclaimed. Actually, I have one too, Harajit said. How funny. I don't remember getting hurt either. Sarah's on to something. No one randomly gets hurt that much. I even have a video to prove something is wrong, I told them. Come to my house at 8. I'll show it to you guys. It's 6 p.m. currently. I'm on my way home. I'm going to watch the recording I took through my camera. I'll update you guys on what happens. Hopefully everything goes well, and my friends finally realize what I told them is true. Update. I went to my house and tried opening the recording. Something very weird happened. The video wasn't there. I rechecked again and again. I could barely breathe. Calm down. Calm down. I told myself. I opened again just to see a strange video uploaded. I opened the strange video, hoping it's nothing unusual. There it was. The masked figure from earlier, right on my screen. My screen starts glitching. I feel my hands tremble and I let out a scream. I'm always watching you, says the figure through my screen. Lights turn on and off, and on and off. I turned around and looked everywhere. On my screen comes a live recording of me. I see myself completely breaking down right in front of my eyes. I'm being recorded. I'm being recorded, help! I scream. I look for the camera everywhere in my room, and I fail to notice it. I still had my pocket knife from earlier in my pocket, and I run away from my room as fast as I could. It's been five minutes since this happened. If anything happens to me, this post is proof of it. I could see myself on the screen. Someone has been spying on me since God knows when. I'm hiding in my basement. I have called the police. I'll see you. That's all for this video. Links to all the posts and their authors are in the description. Leave a like if you made it this far, and as always, thanks for watching.